Formula One drivers are insane at braking. When traveling at speeds of over 300 kilometers an hour, they're consistently applying about 125 kilos of force to the brake pedal precisely within the space of a meter lap after lap. The peak deceleration is over 5G, which is like five times the force of gravity, violently trying to force their face into the steering wheel whenever they stamp on the brake pedal. And that's kind of the easy part. As the cars decelerate rapidly towards the apex of a corner, the insane levels of downforce are also reducing as the car slows. This requires the drivers to precisely bleed off the right amount of brake pressure in order to avoid locking up. And here's another thing, we don't often see huge lockups in Formula One, and that's kind of surprise because anti-lock brakes are banned in Formula 1. So how are the drivers able to confidently brake so hard and so late for every corner while perfectly modulating the brake pressure? Well, let's talk about it. There's no denying that Formula 1 drivers are very skilled with regards to braking, and there's no denying that braking is super physical in an F1 car, but these modern F1 cars have a braking system that help the engineers get the most out of the driver and the car, especially when we're talking about maximizing braking performance. And there's another great benefit of this braking system. Once qualifying has started, the setup of the car is fixed with the exception of brake balance, among other things such as the front wing angle, tire pressures, and differential settings. This makes the brake balance one of the most important tools for drivers and engineers to deal with a wide range of requirements during qualifying and changeable conditions during races, or even just to help manage the tires. But what is brake balance and why is it so important? Brake balance is a fundamental concept for road cars and race cars alike. In a road car, your brake balance is about safety and stability. But in a race car, brake balance is about optimizing deceleration performance, stability, and handling. That's right, brake balance actually impacts the handling and cornering characteristics of a car. Now, tires produce substantially less grip when they're locked up and sliding versus when they're rolling and gripping the surface. So that's why we want to avoid excessive locking on the brakes. Now, it must be said very often when you see a huge lockup in Formula One, it's usually because the drivers tried to brake too late or too deep into the corner. But in order to maximize the braking potential of a car, engineers still need to ensure that the right amount of brake torque is going to both the front and the rear wheel. If the brake balance is wrong, a few things can happen that have a knock-on effect to other things other than just the braking performance. If you apply too much braking torque to the front axle, the tires will lock and you'll lose grip on that axle in understeer. Understeer is the tendency for the car to push on or not to turn despite whatever you're doing with the steering. Now, locking the front tires could also end up like this. On the other hand, if you brake too much with the rear axle, the rears will lock up or slide and the car will tend to oversteer or even spin. Now, oversteer is the tendency for a car to keep turning without adding additional steering. Most road cars and many forms of race cars have anti-lock braking systems, and this is a control system which monitors the wheel rotation speed, and if it detects that a wheel is about to lock, the system can limit the pressure to the brakes for that corner. With ABS, the tires never lock, so the driver can maintain control of the vehicle even if they're applying excessive brake pressure that would otherwise lock the wheels. But, as we said before, anti-lock brakes are banned in Formula One. So, every weekend for every track, the engineers and drivers work closely to optimize the brake balance for every type of corner on the track. But before we talk about what brake balance is and how we optimize it, let's look at a typical brake system on a car. A simple brake system looks something like this. You have a brake pedal, which is attached to two master cylinders, one for the front and one for the rear. You then have the front and rear braking circuits, which connect these master cylinders to the brake calipers for the front or rear axle. When you press the brake pedal, it displaces fluid in the master cylinders. This, in turn, puts pressure on the pistons and the brake calipers, and these pistons press the brake pads into the brake disc, causing friction or braking torque. But as we said before, we need to put the right amount of braking torque on the front and the rear axle so that we don't lock up. How much braking torque goes to which axle depends on the brake balance. And there's a few different notions of brake balance that we could discuss. Now, the most common description of brake balance is just specifying how much pressure you have in the front versus the rear braking circuits. But what we really want to know is the ratio of braking torque on the front versus the rear of the car. Now, this quantity is not only determined by the brake pressure, but the configuration of the brakes, the calipers, the geometry, and the rest of the system. And since we're not gonna focus on the brake system design, we'll just use the term brake balance and braking torque balance interchangeably. But before we can even begin to think about optimizing this brake balance, we need to understand two very fundamental vehicle dynamics concepts. 
Now, this isn't a physics lesson, but we can outline some basic principles here. And the first concept we need to talk about is tire grip. One of the main factors in how much force a tire can generate is how much vertical force is applied to it or how much it's being pressed into the ground. Now, the relationship of tire grip and vertical force is a very interesting one that I'm gonna simplify for this video. For the sake of discussing brake balance, we're gonna assume that the grip is roughly proportional to the vertical force acting on the tires, but this is strictly not true. Now, the second concept we need to talk about is load transfer. Load transfer occurs anytime there's a force acting on the car, but let's focus on the braking forces for now. When the brakes are applied to the car, the tires grip the road surface and generate a braking force. The braking force from the tires causes the car to decelerate, and the deceleration acting on the center of mass of the car causes load transfer, or the weight of the car acting on the tire shifts from the rear towards the front. The amount of load transfer to the front axle depends on the wheelbase, the height of the center of gravity, and the amount of deceleration. And the amount of deceleration depends on how much force the tires can generate. So the maximum amount of braking force from each axle is influenced by the load transfer as well. So let's take a quick look at an example of a normal road car. And let's say we have tires that can produce about 1G of deceleration. And the load transfer might look something like this. Since the front axle now has more vertical load than the rear, we can apply more braking torque to this axle before it starts to lock compared to the rear. Now, let's simplify this whole thing a bit and say that the brake torque distribution that we need should be proportional to the load on each axle. Now, let's say somehow we've managed to get some super grippy road tires that can produce about 1.1 G of deceleration. With more deceleration, we have even more load transfer to the front axle. Since there's now more load on the front axle, the brake balance needs to go even further forwards to match this. Again, otherwise the rear axle locks before we achieve maximum deceleration. So for the same car, we can also say that if we're trying to maximize straight line braking performance, the brake balance depends on how much grip we have. And this is where things start to get exciting. Formula One cars have a few things that road cars don't. Number one, extremely grippy tires. And number two, downforce. And the downforce is what makes this brake balance problem so much more interesting. Downforce increases the vertical load on the car and tires proportional to the speed squared. So to put some numbers on that, at 60 kilometers an hour, a Formula One car makes about 10 to 15% of their weight and downforce. Then at 320 kilometers an hour, Formula One cars are making over four times their weight and downforce. So at speed, we have more vertical force acting on the tires, but the car mass hasn't changed. Since we have more grip to accelerate a car of the same mass, the car can now brake harder, accelerate more rapidly, and corner at higher speeds. But what does downforce have to do with brake balance? Optimizing the brake balance requires us to know the vertical forces acting on each axle. Now we have the static weight on each axle, the load transfer, and now we've got downforce. And again, the amount of load transfer depends on how much grip we have, and we've just added more grip via downforce. So let's put this to an example. To simplify the whole thing, I've made some assumptions and I'll put all my assumptions and some calculations in the description. So if you wanna do the math on this, you can do it yourself. But at the end of a long straight, let's say a car's going 320 kilometers an hour and the driver smashes the brake pedal to generate over 5G of deceleration. If we sum up the static weight, the downforce and the load transfer for the front and rear, we'll find that the total vertical force on the car is distributed about 60% to the front. Then if we use the same calculations to determine the axle loads at speeds between 320 and 80 kilometers an hour at maximum deceleration, it looks something like this. So at 320, you need 60% brake balance. And then at 80 kilometers an hour, you need around 56% brake balance. And to put this whole thing in perspective, a 1% change in brake balance is substantial. But let's say you only had a fixed brake balance, you would only really have the ideal brake balance at one speed on a car with this much downforce. So in order to optimize this car through a wide range of braking speeds, we need a clever system. So before we talk about the brake system, let's talk about the brake shaping maps. The brake balance maps on a Formula One car allow the engineers to adjust the brake balance for a wide range of conditions. The performance engineers, which is my old job, we define the brake balance target maps. The engineers will perform a more detailed version of the calculations we just did they're gonna have a more detailed car setup, they're gonna have better models, and then they'll use these simulations to approximate some starting brake balance map shapes. By regulations, you're only allowed to have five different maps, and those maps will look something like this. The maps will have three main characteristics. The first is the brake balance at peak brake pressure. This is for optimizing our straight line brake balance from high speeds. The second point is the knee point, and this determines the point at which the brake pressure and speeds start to migrate rearwards. And then the third thing is the migration level. This determines how much rearwards the brake balance shifts as the driver bleeds off the brakes. Now, the shape alone is not just for optimizing straight line brake balance. 
Different levels of migration can also be used to increase rotation or stabilize the car when braking into a corner. So the brakes have a knock-on effect on cornering performance. Because of this characteristic, you'll hear the engineers refer to them as brake maps or brake shape maps. The drivers select these maps on the steering wheel by the B-Bal or brake balance rotary. The drivers can also shift the overall brake balance forwards or rearwards without changing the shape with the offset buttons. And these are usually labeled on a steering wheel as BB plus and BB minus. Now, a combination of the brake shape and offset maps allow the driver to have so much flexibility not only to adjust their straight line braking characteristics, but they can also adjust the handling characteristics of the car as they're trailing off the brakes into the corner. And as I mentioned before, another reason this system is so overpowered is that it's one of the few things that can be adjusted after qualifying. In qualifying, drivers can make up to probably five or six brake balance map shape and offset changes in order to dial in the perfect brake balance for each corner. And during the race, the overall brake balance could shift several percent to deal with degrading tires or changing track conditions. But we've just talked about the control maps. How does the car actually achieve this level of dynamic brake balance? The current Formula One cars have a hybrid power unit, which recovers energy by braking with an electrical motor on the rear axle. You've probably heard of this before, and it's called the MGUK, or Motor Generator Unit Kinetic. The cars also have rear brakes, but in order to combine the rear brakes with the MGUK and the engine braking, Formula One cars have what is called a rear axle brake by wire system, which means the rear brakes are independently controlled from the fronts. So here's how that works. In this system, we have a front master cylinder directly connected to the front braking circuit. So the braking torque on the front axle is controlled by how much force the driver applies to the brake pedal. The rear master cylinder is not connected to the rear brakes. It's deadheaded into a sensor. We then have a remote separate powered master cylinder which controls the rear brake circuit and this is the brake by wire part. And then of course we've got the combustion engine and the MGUK driving or braking the rear wheels through the gearbox. But we still need a strategy to use all of these different components. In general, the management strategy looks something like this. When you apply the brakes, you specify demand on the front axle. Then the system uses your shaping maps to determine a target for the rear axle but the computer has to decide how to split up this torque. In general, the main goal is to ensure that the MGUK is always recovering as much energy as possible or as needed, so it will typically apply the MGUK first. Also, during braking, we don't want to waste fuel firing the engine, so it calculates how much braking torque that the engine is producing when the throttles are closed. Then finally, we still need to apply the rear brakes in order to reach the target. So the powered master cylinder receives a signal from the computer telling it how much brakes to apply. Now, Formula One drivers are certainly insanely skilled and amazing at braking, but this level of braking performance would be difficult to match without the awesome brake by wire systems on modern Formula One cars. Now, if you're wondering how do the engineers use all this brake balance and engine braking to tune the handling of the car, you should definitely subscribe to the channel because I will be doing that video in the future. In the meantime, I've left a few other technical analysis videos here that you should definitely check out.